If I was to give any advice to anyone that's looking to build and starting either media or product first, you got to know your demographic. Mm -hmm. That is lesson number one, because if you're not focused on that value proposition from day one, and you start bringing the wrong people in, you're going to go into a negative either engagement or algorithmic spiral. Because for us, if we have an 18 to 45 US male demographic and we start serving ads up to a 65 year old Cambodian lady, she's going to bounce really fast or she's not going to click through whatever it is. And all of these are signals to the al algorithm that she doesn't care about the content. And the more people that don't care about the content or the product, the more of an uphill battle it's going to be against uh, getting put into search and related. And that is another lesson that a lot of people don't know. It's mm -hmm. like search related discovery. That is, I would, I would argue most successful creators, that's going to be 50 to 70% of their, their impressions. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Richard here with me. Uh, Black Rifle Coffee is a fucking <laughs> massive company. Yeah, your right? crew's wearing a hat. I Literally, you walk in, people got hats on. Everyone loves the product. Uh, it's a massive business, now publicly traded business. Uh, you guys went public at a multi-billion dollar valuation, whole thing. We'll talk about Black Rifle Coffee in a second. But you had a whole life before Black Rifle Coffee. Yeah. How the hell do you go from doing all these other things to eventually starting Black Rifle? Like, what were you doing before? Yeah, uh, let's go down memory lane. Um, I moved out to Los Angeles, uh, early 2000s. Sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was doing the typical pursuing the entertainment career out there. And um, for a period of time, you know, I was homeless living in my truck because Craigslist didn't exist back then. And it was really difficult to find a place in a short period of time because I flew out there relatively quick and was looking at places to stay. And I was like, I'll be out here in three months. They're like, well, we'll have it rented in two days. Mm -hmm. So I drove out there with all my stuff and hopes and dreams and started doing stand up, went to Groundlings, did all the comedy stuff for a while. And I got really frustrated with asking permission to vent creatively. Yep. And about 2006, YouTube came around. I was cast in a top 100 YouTube channel doing sketch comedy. And around the same time, the iPhone came out, 2006, okay. 2007, and started seeing the writing on the walls. And so I taught myself how to program. Mm -hmm. uh, I was sleeping on a porch <laughs> for a period of time, working all these like different jobs. Well, it was it was walled up. It was walled up, but it was you know cheap for LA. It was a four hundred dollar a month yeah, porch. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it was great. I was bartending downtown. I even had this uh, degenerate gambler uh, GC who would come in all the time, and I was really good at picking college football. Okay, I know this is really really random, but I legit I worked probably eight jobs at one time. Okay, and what were you doing in LA though? Just trying to be a comedian? Yeah, I was just trying to do the entertainment thing. All right, it's and hard if you're not funny. It, it, that's true, and I, I am not even close. I am I'm the worst. <laughs> I mean, I remember getting my first laugh on stage. I was like, what is this? <laughs> All uh, right, so you're doing the eight jobs. What do you yeah. end up doing? Yeah, so uh, I teach myself how to program. Mm -hmm. You know, the iPhone comes out, and I start creating mobile apps. Okay. And because we were doing the YouTube thing at that time, YouTube was native to iOS. So you couldn't run ads on it. It was like the calculator app. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, this sucks. I mean, we're getting a lot of views on these videos and everything. So I started creating YouTube apps. So this was about four years before YouTube even had an app in the app store. And I was linking AdSense to content creators so that they can monetize it. And about that time, the partner program came out. Uh, so we could see the writing on the walls that there was gonna be something, a monetization mechanism downstream. But that was kind of like my claim to fame having been so early on. And that led to a great relationship with Alphabet, with Google and YouTube. I came in and helped uh, consult with the product team on various different things like what is now Creator Studio and a lot of the different analytics. Like we went over hotspots and some <laughs> other things to help kind of growth hack your channel and all that fun stuff. And um, yeah, so I, I didn't want to break up the band and the thing that I was doing there on the comedy channel. So I went hard in the paint in a different demographic. So. I sat down and was like, as a branding exercise, what could I do for a specific demographic? I wanted to shift from that 13 to 24 female predominantly to a uh, 18 to 45 male doing action adventure, firearms, explosives, skydiving, all this fun stuff. And because of my relationships with the studios, 
Uh, I would come in, I would consult for them on creative marketing strategies, be it 20th Century Fox, Paramount, Universal, so on. A lot of the game developers too, like Ubisoft. And I would help them figure out their ROI. Because at that time, hindsight's twenty twenty. a lot of the best practices that we have, like just even ads in general, all that was discretionary budgets back in the day. Nobody really knew what they were getting from it. You know, they looked at TV, print, billboard, all that stuff as more effective than what digital was. But for me, I could see clearly through our demographic or key demographics on all the different channels and social platforms that there was something brewing there. There was Mm -hmm. a more intimate relationship being built than that of traditional media. And so from there the studios and ad agencies would be like hey do you want to help promote this product launch and if it fit with my demographic i would do it so for relativity was a good example um i learned how to skydive and i did a halo jump breaching with c4 uh went to aero environment we um broke down the rq11 raven the puma the wasp all these drones and and everything that were incorporated in the movie and for me it was easy because i had this never-ending supply of movies and video games coming out uh put my own kind of creative spin on it with slow motion footage and and everything else and um ultimately i got to where i'm at now with just short of three million subscribers on that and you know a few billion views off of that and about 2015, a little earlier than that, um, Verizon wanted to launch this big Go90 initiative. I think it was a multi-billion dollar initiative that they did. And they were like one of the largest procurers of media at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were buying everything, television shows and series. We launched a digital media daily editorial news brand for the Heartland Millennial Mail. That's a mouthful, but it was just like, we, we need news for that kind of 18 to 35 male yep. and with a slight conservative perspective on it. Now I joke, I tell people like I'm libertarian short of anarchy, but <laughs> they wanted to, they wanted to go a little bit more conservative. So, um, that's the route we went, but it was one of the fastest growing digital media brands they ever invested in. I think we got a million subscribers the first year, everything all organic because we were kind of the bastard child because we were that conservative brand in that massively blue, I guess, uh, portfolio. But ultimately, um, you know, I stepped away from it in 2017 because the success of Black Rifle Coffee. Um, What's the story there with Black Rifle? Yeah, so... How does that get started? Yeah, so, so of my partners, Jared, Matt, and Evan... Everyone kind of had irons and other fires. Mm -hmm. Those guys were focused on transitioning from their time in military service into civilian life, and they had modes to do so with these different businesses. Jared and Matt had Article 15 clothing. Uh, I think they have a whiskey company and some other stuff too. And Evan was doing Twist Rate, which was a tactical instructional uh, media company. And then there was Ready Man, which was um, American kind of uh, preparedness um, strategy tutorials and stuff like that. And Evan and Matt JT wanted to do a sample coffee roast profile for Article 15 clothing, and it sold out super, super fast. I think it was a thousand bags or something like that. I'm, I'm going to be off on the numbers, but it sold out extremely fast to the point where they were like, hey, maybe there's something here. Mm -hmm. And so, and what, like when you're selling those bags, how much are you selling them for usually? Um, now we're selling them for about 16 bucks. Okay. Yeah. And how much does it cost the business to actually get the bag, make the bag? It varies. Okay. And so that was, that was some of the challenges early on because we really didn't know what volume was mm-hmm. going to be. And that is for a CPG company, hard. N- extremely hard, not knowing how and when to turn those dials. Our first year I did. 350 million views on my content promoting the brand Mm -hmm. and that's through verizon so in my contract with verizon i had that i could promote my own brands which is great because it was on their dime um and they were they were happy with it because i brought all my friends all of my talent into Mm -hmm. that network to help this symbiotic relationship grow which ultimately led to them having the fastest growing digital brand they ever invested in Um, so for us, 350 million organic by me alone, Matt, he had a killer Facebook page. He was Mm -hmm. doing these 
uh, rap videos and stuff like that that really really related to just everybody. It was hilarious stuff. But the organic traffic alone in our first year, most people would kill for. I mean, you break that down in a CPM, uh, a startup, most people can't afford that. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it became this challenge in trying to figure out uh, really how to turn those dials because you get a viral video and you only have enough supply for 10,000 customers, you're going to get a lot of customer service inquiries, a lot of pissed off people Mm -hmm. that, you know, they're really frustrated with not being able to get their product because it's taken a month or whatever. So for us, it became this challenge and hats off to Evan. The dude is just a phenomenal, an exceptional businessman. He like, we, we reinvested everything that the company made back into shoring up the supply chain. We, you know, we had to turn dials with other roasters Mm -hmm. whenever we did get those viral hits or we get on say Fox news or something like that. We'd have to lean on third parties to help us scale our roasts to be able to meet the demand. So we ultimately reinvested into a roasting facility in Nashville, well, Manchester, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Um, and that allowed us to be able to turn the dial ourselves, which increased our profit margins, which uh, today you see a lot of other coffee companies out there. Most of them are white label. They're, mm-hmm. they're going to the same people we did back mm-hmm. in the day. So their profit margins aren't going to be anywhere near what ours are. Uh, and again, hats off to Evan for really like focusing on that. And the, the guy's just been exceptional at what he does and, and hiring fast, firing fast. Uh, third parties and and whatnot and being able to scale the business. So when you think about that business, how much of it was dependent early on with the organic views from just kind of like the core group versus Mm -hmm. today it's the same thing, right? Or have you guys gotten much smarter? Because I see you guys have podcasts, you have tons of sponsorships, like there's a bunch of stuff now going on where it almost to some degree feels like a marketing company with a, you know, a coffee product. Mm -hmm. And that's almost been the secret to the success. Is that like a fair way to think about it? Absolutely. I mean, you yeah. you can 110% say we're a media company that sells a product. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, early on the strategy, like, and I, this isn't no secret. I did this with Verizon. I did it with us. So I establish a foundation. It starts with inspiration and education videos. And then there's entertainment videos uh, or education and uh, information, then entertainment, and then inspiration. Mm-hmm. So our foundation was education, be it how to make coffee in a Chemex, how to fold a Chemex coffee filter. You know, those things are intimidating to a lot of people. So we build this in, this massive library that when people come to us, they know we're the subject matter expert on this, but they also get valuable information on how to make their coffee. What's the best coffee? What are our coffees taste like? And then when we start hitting these entertaining viral pieces of content, they have this library to go to, but then we work the algorithm. Because now YouTube or whoever is seeing that, oh, this video is successful. What about these other videos? So we're going to rank higher when people are looking for coffee stuff just based off of the affiliation between our high performers. And then we switch gears into inspiration. So we shift the mission uh, or we shift the content to our mission statement, which is as far as a company is concerned, we're helping veterans transition from military service like our founders did into civilian life. Mm -hmm. But then for our nonprofit and the company in itself, um, giving back to veteran and first responder communities. And so having done that, without organic content, we wouldn't be who we are. Without social media, Black Rifle Coffee doesn't exist. I will confidently say that. Now, early days, if anyone said that that was going to you know, be the thing that all of us were, you know, chips in on, they'd be lying if they said that, mm-hmm. because we just didn't know back then It's just a series. What, what's the, what's the saying where, uh, luck is the intersection of opportunity and preparedness. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was mm-hmm. like, 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 again, hats off to my partners and everyone, because we, everyone was so ready and willing to take up the mission mm-hmm. that I, I don't think that anybody else could have pulled it off like that. How important was it that the product was coffee versus anything else? I think it was re- extremely important okay, because you, you look at the saturation point of specific products at the time. Article 15 is a great example where you had Matt and JT, two of my other partners, they had a t-shirt company, predominantly t-shirt. They sold other stuff, but then 
the market started to saturate. You started getting all the all these other um, veterans exit in their their military service, and then they started these t-shirt companies. It started to get a little saturated, mm -hmm. and like, okay, well, what's my value proposition that somebody? At, what's unique to it and everything? For us, coffee was unique. I mean, say what you want about Starbucks, but Howard Schultz really he was the Steve Jobs of coffee. He changed an industry. I mean, he took sugar water and made it an everyday thing. Like I think their, their uh, tagline is they're the third place. So there's work and there's home and they're the third place. Mm -hmm. um, and it's true. I mean, you see how it's infiltrated pretty much pop culture as it is. Um, and so now where was I going on that? <laughs> in, in, in terms of the coffee itself yeah. though, like could you have done it with, I don't know, fucking body soap? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, like sorry. Anything else? Yeah, so, so coffee was a unique, it was a unique good in that it really appealed to the culture. So that key demographic of the 18 to 45 male, specifically military culture, because everybody is drinking caffeine, yep. be it energy drinks or coffee, and nobody else was doing that. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, you had this, you had this, which became in that 2016 era of Trump uh, and the whole polarization in politics. It became, you know, Starbucks started leaning harder left in that mm -hmm. with the immigration, um, you know, statements and, and everything else. And so we became that that alternative for mm -hmm. the military culture and, and specifically like the, the conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, and that was to our benefit because there was nobody else in that sector. And does coffee like align really well with the videos and, and blowing things up and like kind of like the hard charging, extraordinary life, you know, type content is that's somebody who drinks a lot of coffee. I mean, you could say that, but I, I would argue that's just convenient. Okay. Because I've, I've made the joke that men want to be Matt women want to do him. It's, it's just, you, it's hard not to like the people in the company. Mm -hmm. You hang out with everyone. Like Jared is a social butterfly. Like that guy, he knows more people than anybody else I know. Like I'll, I'll, I'll run into a random guy on the street and BF, I don't know, Oklahoma. I'm like, oh, you know JT? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like everybody knows these guys. Everybody wants to be them or be around them or hang out. And I think that's just, it was a convenient thing that Evan was just smart enough to really focus on optimizing the business mm -hmm. and scaling it in a way as fast as possible and as efficient as possible. How did you guys fund it? Was it all self-funded? It was self-funded for the most part. Yeah. Um, we brought investors in uh, at a couple points mm -hmm. for various different things, the roaster um, facilities, um, but... Yeah, we didn't we didn't really bring in a lot of yeah. And then uh, the whole idea of going public. I think yeah. a lot of people when they start a coffee company, and they're like, "We're fucking around on the internet. We're gonna sell coffee." Yeah. Oh, look, it works. Okay, that's cool. Oh, wait, hold on, it's like really working. At what point or like why go public? Yeah, so that's interesting because going into COVID, we were positioned really well because we're a D to C company primarily, mm -hmm. and we didn't have the overhead that a lot of CPG companies had getting caught with their pants down mm -hmm. when everything was shut down. We were able to still roast, mm -hmm. still ship and get to our consumers. And if anything, they were, they were drinking more at home than going out and stopping at say a Starbucks or mm -hmm. a Dutch bros or Duncan or wherever. And that worked to our benefit. But as COVID started easing up restrictions in these different areas, our focus was scaling out brick and mortar or outposts mm -hmm. so that we could position ourselves around these, military bases and larger markets strategically to get to our customers in a day-to-day -day kind of convenient way. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that experience, what is like the biggest surprise through the whole thing of mm. building that business? That's a Whatever tough. you just thought, say that. What, no. what is that? What, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what was that surprise? Uh, uh, yeah. No. So for me, again, this goes back. Nah, to, don't fucking bullshit me. What is that? Okay. So this goes back to the libertarian thing. I like I I fall under a lot of scrutiny because a lot of three letter organizations like DOD and ATF, uh, I fall under their oversight. Uh, they like you or no? I, I don't know. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm buttoned up, soup to nuts. I dot every I, I cross every T. 
But I just don't want another one like the SEC in my life mm-hmm. where I come on the po- podcast and I say something about revenue and I was like, oh, shit, that's a forward looking statement. It's like and then I have to like like I'm not Elon Musk. I can't take like a yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 200 million dollar fine or something like that. So I just don't like that oversight like that's. I have too much oversight in my life. I like to be candid yeah. and I like to be as uh, transparent as possible. I don't like worrying about what I say. That's fair. Yeah. That's very fair. All yeah. right. And now you're doing other things other than just Black Rifle Coffee. So yeah. explain that. Yeah. So I feel fortunate in that the way I look at life is I'm a subject matter enthusiast. Mm-hmm. I've been really good at the things that I do because I approach it as a consumer or a viewer. This is what I want, and this is where I see the industry going. And for me, I've seen the writing on the wall with social, with um, mobile, where I see it again in blockchain. Mm-hmm. And there's an opportunity here. And unfortunately, there's all these people looking to extract value early days and not necessarily provide value to move the ball. And I'll tell you what I mean by that is like early days mobile, there were a lot of people who made millions of dollars on the flashlight app. And I don't care about that. I, I get it, get your bag, secure it, have fun, do your thing. How much do you but- guys make on the IPO? Hey guys, what's going on? I hope that you're enjoying this conversation. I wanted to interrupt for a second to tell you about an event that we're hosting on March 4th at the Miami Beach Convention Center. It's called Lyceum Miami, and I've gone and asked some of the most popular guests from this show over the years to come in person at the event. It's gonna be awesome. We have everyone from Kathy Wood to Vivek Ramaswamy, Chris Williamson, Cody Sanchez, and many, many others. I also even have a couple of surprises for each one of you if you show up. The best part about this event is it is completely free to attend. That's right, all general admission tickets are free. You simply need to go to LyceumMiami.com. LyceumMiami.com will get you free tickets on March 4th at the Miami Beach Convention Center. And if you're a big baller and don't just want to get a free ticket, you can also get a VIP or an insider pass. If you use the code POMP40, you'll get 40% off. They get you all kinds of cool things like the night before, a cocktail with the actual speakers and a couple other perks. Go check it all out at LyceumMiami.com and use code POMP40 if you want to be a baller. I can't wait to see all of you there. Go ahead and click on the link in the description and let's get back into this conversation. Are you allowed to say? Um, I don't know if cap tables are public or not. I assume yeah, so. If it's like, yeah. Well, when you go public, yeah. Like how much do you think like the core team before or whatever made? I don't know. I don't know. I'm so reluctant to say numbers. <laughs> 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 yeah, but so, so having said that about the flashlight app. Uh, yeah. So, you know. And I'm public at 2 billion. Yeah. So like the four of you. Yeah. You, you did okay. Maybe, yeah, I assume so. Yeah, you'll have to talk to my accountants. But so uh, the App Store, like Apple's going to replace that. It's going to be native, right, to iOS. I'm looking five, ten years out, like inventory control management via mobile do- device, which is what we were talking about earlier with Best Buy. Most people, you know, now hindsight's twenty twenty. You have the benefit of that. You can say, hey, look, you know, I can go to Best Buy and check the inventory before I get there. 15 years ago, you couldn't. Mm-hmm. And most people weren't thinking about that then. I was. I just didn't have the money to patent that process yep. or, or start building it for people. Uh, and so I see this this opportunity in blockchain and the sins of Web 2. And, you know, unfortunately, what, trying to break this down for my viewers who might be listening in on this, you know, the early days of Web 2, you know, unfortunately, there wasn't a payment mechanism built into the HTTP protocol. Had there been, we might not have taken traditional media advertising like overlays, native, and everything else and applied it to mm-hmm. Web2 like YouTube and everything else. The unfortunate byproduct of that is you know, we're, we're all about a quantity. We, we want sheer volume of impressions because that's what gets you ads. That's what gets you results. So you have to tap on the nerve. You got a fight or flight response. You got to be controversial you got to be angry you got to elicit uh, an emotional reaction from people but i think people really just want value they don't want to be wrecked emotionally and everything so there's a lot of problems that can be solved i think in in web3 where 
through incentive mechanisms, monetization mechanisms, if we get it right and in a permissionless way or decentralized, these are I know these are a lot of buzzwords, but they mean a lot. And the and the implications are are vast mm -hmm. because if you look at the gatekeepers, the the apples, the YouTubes, like their their hardware to their software, like YouTube as an example with the content that I would do on my YouTube channel full mag. Everything's legal. You will not find anyone more buttoned up than me. I have just about every federal license and clearance that you can think of. I have permits. I have insurance. I have instructor ratings, range safety officer, all these different things. And yet still my videos will get demonetized or pulled. And it's really, really frustrating for me because what I'm doing is 100% legal. It's just by doing so, well, you don't have the right to 100% distribution or reach. Like you can still publish it. Well, that's screwed up because I just spent 15 years of my life. And not only that, YouTube invested in my channel. I was I was part of YouTube's next up where they spent, I think it was uh, 40 or $70,000 investing in 25 channels. It's like, oh, okay, now you guys changed the rules of the game, mm -hmm. but I'm doing everything legally. It's just you're changing a social narrative or you're changing the distribution, which is impacting a social narrative. And it's arguably going to make those kids grow up in a world where firearms may be taboo. And it's like, well, I disagree with that. I mm -hmm. think in, unless it's unless it's illegal, all that stuff should be fair game. Like mm -hmm. people should have car a hard conversation about hard topics. Mm -hmm. it's, you shouldn't try to control that for people. So I'm building a lot of products right now. You know, I, I know there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, we'll do the guns YouTube or we'll do this YouTube. It's like, you're not gonna compete with the second largest search engine. You're not gonna beat them at their game. There has to be a, fund a fundamental shift in, in something like a base layer that's built that people can build on top of, and then they can have their own discovery. And again, I go back to the incentive mechanisms and the monetization mechanisms. Those are the key components. But short term, I'm working on some security products because I think that that's really important. A lot of people are getting scammed. A lot of people are getting fished. Um, How bad do you think that problem is? I, I would say it is it is 99% of all attack. Uh, stems from some form of phishing. phishing yeah because most people they say oh i got hacked it's like no dude you clicked on a link here or mm -hmm. did this like no, there are a few instances where um, higher level organizations may have the ability to access devices remotely pion attacks and stuff like that but realistically speaking the bulk majority of consumers are getting fished yeah. now there may be some people that are getting spear spear fished uh where they're being specifically targeted but um, that's, that's it. So like, I'm trying to figure out ways to mitigate that and, and, and reduce that risk. When you look kind of zoom out in the world, what are like the big things that you think are important right now? So obviously you guys did black rifle coffee. You're focused some on the security stuff. Like what else in the world interests you right now? Yeah, it's a tough one because I'm at this point in life where I, th I think you hit a point you probably did uh, when you had your first child. Uh, it, it, it's like, what does it all mean? <laughs> I know this very, <laughs> it's like, it's an existential crisis moment or, or something along those lines. But, it, you know, at the end of the day, if if we're just eating, sleeping, living, and then dying, at some point, you've got to make the world a better place. Like, you've got to put a positive impact. So it starts with your family, then your community, maybe your state, and then higher up. I, I do think people should vote third party and get away from <laughs> the polarization in politics, like fi specifically on a local level. Like I would like just play as active a role in your community as, as possible. I don't generally talk about charitable stuff, but mm -hmm. one of the things I think have really, like really, really big impacts um, on the day to day, like whenever I was living in Los Angeles, um, again, you know, it's hard not to get emotional. It was like, didn't, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of money, yeah. but I, I made sure I, I spent the time to give back. Mm -hmm. So every Tuesday I go animal shelters and walk dogs because mm -hmm. it would help with their kennel anxiety. And most of the volunteers you just go, you can walk a dog. Yeah. So oh man, this would like, so the LA system is uh -huh. like, it's such a, a process. It took me almost a year to qualify mm -hmm. because wait, wait, you got to apply and yeah. then they approve you because they don't want people just coming and doing it for the holidays and then leaving. 
oh, interesting. Basically, yeah. they want you to be a regular. Yeah. And so you have to go through this whole process. Okay. And then once you get cleared and everything, then you're good to go. And which it was, it was really gratifying for me because, again, this is early days of social media. But so I, I created like the Facebook page for the North Valley Animal Shelter, which mm -hmm. was this, it was one of the highest kill rate shelters in the US, but predominantly most of their walkers were younger female. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't, most of the dogs coming in are either pit bulls or chihuahuas. Mm -hmm. And those have the highest euthanasia rate. And so you know, none of the pit bulls would get walked because they were just you know too big. Mm -hmm. And so it was one of those things that I could I could do, go there, walk, work with them and everything. And hopefully um, that made them more adoptable and relieved some of that kennel anxiety and um, helped a few out there along the process. But it, people, I think they, uh, I think they think that a dollar here to this organization is great, but I think your time is so much more valuable and you can make a m much greater meaningful impact directly in your community than worrying about too many things abroad. If mm -hmm. your whole focus is things uh, outside of your community, I think you're missing an opportunity mm -hmm. to really make a, a positive impact. I, I completely agree. And I also think that a lot of people, because of social media, they focus on uh, international or even national level issues, but there's shit going on in your backyard. Yeah, right. for sure. And, and actually, there's a lot of shit going on in your backyard. Yeah. And um, I always ask people, like, when's the last time you watched the local news? Never. Right. Yeah. Like who, who watched the local news? Right. Yeah. Um, and so when you do that, you start to realize, like, again, it's not all bad. Y yes, there's car crashes, there's, sure. you know, crime or, or whatever. But also, like, there's somebody literally within a, you know, three mile radius of your of where you are that needs help or yeah. could use a helping hand or, you know, whatever. And if you just focus on that, like that's something you can actually impact what's going on in another country. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Right, just a little bit harder, and and I would add to that too. Like, it's not always hardship too. There, there's other means of giving back to your community. It could be mentorship, mm -hmm. because there, you know, there are a lot of single parents out there, and us as professionals, there may be people out there that could use some advice. It could be professional advice. It could be, you know, personal advice. There's there's so many ways to have a positive impact, and I think so many people are isolated, even though they're so well connected and social. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we start trying to find ways to interact with people in our day to day, that's not wholly digital, I think the better off we'll be. Yeah. Uh, are there other products that you see people building or other companies that you're like, wow, they're really onto something They're They're absolutely killing it right now. Like when I just asked that, like what, what products or companies jump to mind as like, they seem to really have figured something out. <laughs> for, for people listening, he's drinking a liquid death out of a can. That's a that's a first. Do you understand that this is the highest ROI thing that they do? Uh, yeah. For for people who don't know, I'm an investor in the company, and so they send all these cans, and like I just like to be completely honest. The only reason why I like drinking it, other than we're probably making money as people see it, is uh, it's in a can, it's not in a bottle. Yes. Right. And like. Every person I've talked to in the health industry is like, stop drinking out of plastic bottles. Okay, cool. This is not a plastic bottle. Feel like I'm doing my like health kick. Uh, but other than that, what else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> then the people who are selling water hats in off a to can. them. I, I love the, <laughs> I love the hydration packets. So, Protect is mm -hmm. a veteran-owned company, and they do these hydration packets. Also, um, sleep packets. Um, they have like melatonin, GABA in them. Um, LMNT is another great one. It's all all those things are the things that kind of have a day to day impact for me. <coughs> so it's it's hard to I, I don't really FOMO on many brands, but I, I I really like what those guys are doing just because I use them on a day to day. Yeah, yeah. The um the other thing is I've seen more and more companies try to become media businesses, so they have the products, and then they go try to build the media stuff, and it feels like there's a lot of people who are realizing like maybe you should do it the other way, is yeah. like build build the distribution and then figure out the products chicken in the egg, right? Because there's there's risk when you build a brand as a media company and most brands rely on personalities early on if they're going to do it that way because there needs to be a collaborative component to it. Typically, there's exceptions to all rules, but there's a risk if your key talent isn't 
founders, owners in that. Yeah, I don't know. That's a chicken or egg. It, they're both problems to solve for. Uh, I, I, it's a cautionary tale for those who do do the media thing, and then they try to throw a whole lot of money at it in advertising, because typically what happens is they bring the wrong people in to help them advertise, and their sample audiences are such a broad demographic. If I was to give any advice to media or CPG companies or anyone that's looking to build and starting either media or product first, you got to know your demographic. Mm -hmm. That is lesson number one, because if you're not focused on that value proposition from day one and you start bringing the wrong people in, you're going to go into a negative um, either engagement or algorithmic spiral. Because for us, if we have an 18 to 45 U.S. male demographic and we start serving ads up to a 65-year-old Cambodian lady, she's going to bounce really fast or she's not going to click through, whatever it is. And all of these are signals to the al algorithm that she doesn't care about the content. And the more people that don't care about the content or the product, the more of an uphill battle it's going to be against uh, getting put into search and related. And that is another lesson that a lot of people don't know. It's mm -hmm. like search and related discovery. That is... I would I would argue most successful creators that's going to be fifty to seventy percent of their their impressions. Yeah, it's coming just from the search. Yeah, or related. Mm -hmm. yeah. What other platforms do you think people should be posting content on? Like, are you long on YouTube Shorts, on TikTok, on Reels, on fucking something I've never heard of before? Man, that's a that's a big one, right? Because you have Alphabet, which is publicly traded, and who knows what's going to happen with TikTok? But you also have a potential Section 230 ruling coming up January by January 30th, and that has potential implications for all curators. <coughs> that is a that's a highly contested uh, topic, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. I have strong opinions about it. I think that. What do you think? I, I think that the the platforms have been hiding behind their Section 230 privileges for too long, mm -hmm. and there needs to be some changes to it. Mm -hmm. Also, if you do away with it, that takes away the search and related component mm -hmm. to or the, the, the recommended, sorry. Um, that has implications for the recommended content, which YouTube is extremely good at recommending content, but also have a chip on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. They don't like to recommend this stuff that I make because it's not advertiser safe or mm -hmm. advertiser friendly. I'm like, well, uh, screw you. If an advertiser spending millions of dollars a year like Target and they don't know how to set exclusions for the type of content that I create that is 100% uh, legal, I'm sorry. Why should a whole industry of content creators suffer that who have built their entire business models off of something you said was good? five years ago, mm -hmm. but now the tides have shifted because it's not politically, you know, acceptable. Do you think that when they limit monetization, it kills the virality 100%, of the video? And I can show you the analytics. They, because, claim, they claim that's not true. Well, they're full of shit and I can prove it. Like I have, I have, I have the data. Like fortunately for me, I can say I have a library of videos that go span 12, 15 years. And so some of my top performers are from eight years ago. And they have 20, 30 million views. And the cool thing about analytics is you can see these clear spikes and dips. And I get emails when they demonetize the video. And there is a spike the day of straight down. And then I appeal it. It gets, it gets approved. And we go through this whole thing. And it takes weeks, sometimes months. And the views go from, um, you know, I don't know. Let's call it a million views a month to... A thousand views a month when it's demonetized, and then as soon as I get it remonetized, it goes back up. And you could argue that something happened in the world, and maybe that changed that. But two of my videos, they demonetized them twice, and the spikes are clear. You want to see time. something hilarious? Yeah, this is a video that has uh, one hundred thirty thousand views on it, right? You tell me where in the video they demonetized it. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> super clear. <laughs> Super clear. <laughs> like what? Where? Where are we going here? <laughs> right? The, it, you tell me where they demonetize that video. 
They claim that there's no impact from demonetization, but uh, (laughs) I don't know what happened. (laughs) Yeah, and they'll and they'll they'll give you some, and I I I totally understand it. I know a lot of people in YouTube, and I feel sorry that a lot of people get yelled at and these emails and phone calls. I don't don't yell. I understand the job's hard, but it's still frustrating as a businessman who's who's not only YouTube's invested in me, but I've built my brands and like like uh, the, the ego is attached to that. My yeah, I feel like my soul's attached to it in some way where it's like to lose that is it. I don't know. It, I, it's, I actually it's more. think if I was them, I would just be like, yeah, when we demonetize the video or we limit the monetization, distribution goes down because we don't make as much money off the video. You know, we would all say like, Makes I'll pay sense. it well, or, or I'll pay it or make sense. Yeah. Right. Like, got it. OK, yeah. well, let's not get demonetized. Yeah, I, I think it's I, the fact that people all believe. I mean, when you see that, right, and you're like, literally, that exact moment is when they demonetize the video and people see that. I think that they're like, dude, why are you guys just just say that that's what's happening? No, I call bullshit because if it was just a monetization thing and they were worried about their advertisers, screw it. I have a coffee company. We pay a lot of influencers for impressions. I will monetize every single one of their channels. We already run the Shopify cart underneath our YouTube videos. How about you let us buy all the ad inventory of all those people you're demonetizing? We'll run our ads on it. Give us an advantageous revenue share split on it, but they won't do it. So because it's on principle, they don't want the distribution. Like they don't want that that content to reach trending or whatever it is. I'll sell the ads. Yeah. I don't care. If you're worried about the hosting and the streaming bandwidth, fuck it. I'll pay for it. Does the Shopify cart underneath the YouTube ad, uh, YouTube video work? Yeah, of course. People buy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you. It, to be fair, it takes work, right? And you have to have product that people actually care about. Mm-hmm. A great a great strategy is if you're incorporating any type of product in a video, you curate that product through the carousel on the bottom. Mm-hmm. So it's easy for people to, to, to click through on it. To see it right there. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, what, what other secrets or tips or tricks do you have for people who, uh, are trying to be on the internet? <laughs> this, I, I literally people, it's like people come out of the yeah. woodwork. I, I don't want to say who it is, but, uh, yeah. I recently had somebody who was an accountant, uh, at an accounting firm I don't use. They reached out to me and they were like, Hey, I want to become like a accounting influencer person. Yeah. And I was like, why would you want to do that? And they're like, well, cause eventually I could leave. Maybe I could make a living just doing the content, but also then I could start my own accounting firm. And like they had this whole little plan and I was like, Sure. Like, why not? Right. Guess yeah. what I do? If I need an accountant, like millions of other people around the world, they Google. And if your content is ranking up there, like you have some advantage, whether it's through ads, whether it's through building a business, whatever. Sure. But I was like, oh, every single industry, somebody's going to try to do this. Okay. So let's break this down just off of your accountant. Um, I love doing these kind of thought exercises with people because it's generally, it, it's no effort for me. Mm-hmm. I have an opinion. Again, I'm a subject matter enthusiast. Take my advice with a grain of salt. Algorithms change, policies change, and you know what's working for people today probably won't six months from now. But having said that, for your accountant and really anyone, be consistent with your value proposition from day one. You can experiment here and there, yes, but Don't fall into the trap of vanity metrics. Your ego wants you to get those vanity metrics, the likes, the comments, the uh, views, and everything else. None of that shit matters. Mm -hmm. What matters is the people coming to consume your content care about it. That is it. Like if if you if if your goal is to get views, you might as well just be getting bikini models or mm-hmm. something like that. It turn into another form of Instagram, right? You do a, a a provocative photo or something like that, or somebody being outrageous in the thumbnail. Yeah, you'll get views, but people only buy into that for so long. And if your value proposition isn't consistent, again, let's go with your accountant here. He's starting a channel. Start creating accounting content. Don't fall into the trap of being sensational. Oh, blah, blah, blah. But be relevant in your space. Hey, I don't know what what accounting thing is happening here in the world. Um, You know, BlackRock's doing this or whatever it is and and break it down for your viewers. Or, hey, here is 10 ways to save money on your taxes. Do collaborations. He's going to have Anthony over and we're going to talk about my taxes today and we're going to disclose to everybody how much you made in 2022 or whatever it is, right? These things, these things that can help him grow, but he stays in his lane and stays consistently. 
Um, hot that sp- that show would fucking pop if yeah. somebody if there was an accountant that created a show and they there, broke down I mean there are a lot and there's a no if you broke down oh. people's taxes yeah. <laughs> yeah especially if you start getting celebrities well can and, you imagine and, and, again here's here's one John of, Travolta used this tax trick to avoid <laughs> it's beautiful <laughs> it's sorry beautiful. I don't know anything about John Travolta I just figured he'd be a good no person it's great to, but then, like <laughs> and again I I geek out on this like I'm yeah. giving this dude a million and one suggestions I'd probably go on Social Blade. Mm-hmm. Or one of these websites, and and try to forecast what a creator would make based off of impressions. Look and see if they had any ad deals, and then maybe forecast what a production cost, and like itemize and deduct, and all these other different things. You could do like a, a a high level forensic for what it is, like without actually having access to that stuff. And people would it would probably grow. And then he could throw in these these really viable, healthy healthy like hacks for people who don't have YouTube channels or whatever mm-hmm. it is, uh, but be consistent with that. And again, like I was showing you earlier with hotspots and everything, he could probably find a lot of videos and ride on the coattails of it by segmenting and commenting on that stuff as a subject matter expert. The, um, the other thing I think a lot about is like, that's obviously like a services type business that eventually could be content, but the physical products, I'm shocked at how many businesses that are in the physical product game do not understand how powerful the internet is. Like we've been doing this shit now for 20 years, yeah. right? Like, like the internet works, right? Well, the content works. It does, but, but they still don't do it. Think about it this way though. If you have a, a CPG company and you have distribution and it's all you need, you're not D to C. Do you want the headache of scaling it that way? Like, I mean, some people, some people get in Walmart or Target and they're like, I'm good. Mm-hmm. I've got that. Like, I've, 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 I've stood up this company and I've gone this path before. I don't really want to deal with the headache of doing this thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, to each their own. But if you're, if you're a, a big brand, I think that you're missing an opportunity for the longevity mm-hmm. to not have some type of emotional fabric woven in a media narrative to kind of solidify that relationship with your your consumer Mm -hmm. when you think about um take uh somebody like mr beast right he just uh they launched a new feastable uh chocolate bar i think they're calling it d's nuts yeah uh and i saw them tweet out and say uh like whoever controls the memes controls the internet how like how do you control the memes Jimmy's like it's it's weird saying it, but Jimmy, I think Jimmy, is the one Jimmy's who- a beast. <laughs> I mean, he is <laughs> the beast. Uh, he's his own animal. Like I'm using all these puns, but I use them typically in that reference. But um, yeah, he's just a completely different different machine. Like the dude is. Yeah, I like it, it, he's he's apples and oranges in so many ways. Mm-hmm. He's on such another level now that I feel like he could jump into any market as passionately as he is on everything else and just crush it. Mm -hmm. Like he could, as long as he has the right teams to maintain the QC and scale, I think whatever he does, like I think the average brand or entrepreneur isn't going to have that. Yeah, of course. That. But like, how, how do you create or control the memes in the way that they're doing? Is it just because he's got such a big audience, he says something and it's cool? I think that's it. I mean, he's, to be fair, what he says is relevant. Mm-hmm. What he says is funny. But a lot of other people do on the internet too. And mm-hmm. it doesn't catch like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people, some people. It's I, like Prime. You, you know the yeah. uh, drink Prime? Yeah. You see course. the numbers recently? No. <laughs> They claim they did, uh, I think it was Logan Paul. My brother was tweeting about it. I think it's $250 million in revenue last year. And I think in January, they did like $40 million in revenue. Wow. It's got to be a $2, $3 billion company. But where are they selling? Here's the crazy part. Talk to anybody with like a middle school child, especially a middle school boy. They can't find it. It's yeah. sold out in all of these stores. But is it D to C or they have distribution somewhere? I think somewhere? that they have some D to C, but it's, it's, in, uh, it's definitely in gas stations. I've seen them in gas stations. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, they've like gone like the traditional uh, distribution path as well. Yeah. And so like, I don't care what you're, uh, you can be selling fucking piece of paper. You sell $250 million worth of piece of paper in a year. You got a real business. 
Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Props to him, man. Props to him. That is right to wow. two influencers. Wow. Uh, who like I would argue aren't just influencers, right? Obviously these no. guys understand very, very well how they're, to do They're really smart businessmen. They are lifestyle brands of themselves. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I had no clue. Jeez. So to, uh, to be on pace, let's call it for somewhere between 400 and 500 million dollars in revenue in 2023 for a drink business, you know, for for like a beverage business. Coca-Cola is going to call at some point for sure. And I just I you I wanna, look, you want to guess? Let's just put it on the record. What do you think they get bought for? I mean it depends. I mean that like how old are they? The business? Yeah. Uh, not that old. I mean Definitely I mean, less than five years old. Yeah, sure. I mean, given the market and everything, I would say at least a five X of annual, right? Of annual revenue? Yeah. Yeah. I think that they have the potential. The potential. Five billion dollar or higher exit. Wow. Which is basically all they gotta do is if they continue to grow at kind of the rate that they're growing, yeah. Right? You need another two to three years. If you can basically hold on and not sell. You're doing a million do- or a billion dollars in revenue. Dirty math. That's what like a 10x multiplier of like. It'd be 10x yeah. from where they essentially are right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. give or take. Yeah. Uh, uh, but if they can hold out for another 12 to 24 months on top of that, Jesus, you basically get to a, you know close to a billion. I'm then- sweating right now. I'm just I'm thinking I'm thinking what is what is that infrastructure look like behind the scenes? Like how did they do this or did they just did they just work an agreement with somebody that could scale it, white label it? And I then- don't know all the details, but I think that somebody else had the idea, started like a beverage business, and mm-hmm. then like brought them in. I, I believe that's true. Somebody will correct me if not. Um, but yeah, like it. W- once you get to any type of scale, I think people. It's not like, hey, we came up with this like crazy idea. We don't know what we're doing, and like we just happened to sell all this stuff, right? Yeah, that's the hard thing, right? Because if for a brand to try to find influencers to bring on and kind of snowball it, the risk on the influencer is little to none in that yeah. sense. As long as they know that they can turn the knobs and ramp up production and distribution if they if they follow through on their promise, that's a great deal on their part because then they don't they're they're just sweat equity. They're not necessarily having to even kick in any money. But on the flip side for for influencers who try to build something, man, it is a dice roll. I am so fortunate to have the partners I have. Mm-hmm. Like like Evan just like he Operationally, he stepped up to the plate operationally in a way that I don't think many people could have. Yeah, like he, he, like it's there are so many ways for a business to fail, especially if you're an influencer, Mm -hmm. like trying to turn these dials on scaling a business. It's just it's easier to have somebody who knows what they're doing, and I think that's what Jimmy does too. I Mm -hmm. think he he probably has people reach out to him, his team, his network that can follow through on execution and then he gives the overall creative strategy and marketing and everything else. And then they turn those niles. Mm -hmm. So when, um, uh, when somebody asks you, what do you do? What do you say? Like, are are you an entrepreneur? Are you an investor? Are you a fucking influencer? Are you a YouTuber? It's hard. Are you an explosives expert? I, I struggle with this. And so we just did this PEVC, uh, event, uh, founder event this week. And I just tell people I'm a subject matter enthusiast. <laughs> I find things that I'm really excited about and I go hard in the paint. Mm-hmm. I learn everything that I can about it and I try to be as best as I can in it. it. It's hard because, again, I make this joke that whenever I was in Los Angeles, people perceived me as the gun-toting redneck. And when I was in Nashville, I was the gay love and liberal because people inherently gravitate towards the things they disagree with you on. But I... I, I it's hard because I'm also a developer. I'm a mm-hmm. uh, marketer. I'm like, you know, an entrepreneur, you know, an investor, all these different things. So I, I'm the worst on my social media because of that. Mm-hmm. It's easy for me to define and refine a brand or an influencer, but it's hard for me because I don't want to play that game. Mm-hmm. I don't want people to come to Richard Ryan on social media and only see slow motion guns or only see business advice or only see this new blockchain product. And I probably burn a lot of people whenever I talk about the thing that they're not interested in that consistent value proposition. So I read the room typically and I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm this guy. <laughs> I'm the chameleon. Yeah. 
All right, last question for you yeah. is, uh, I was talking to somebody recently and they were like, a great exercise is 10, 20 years look out and think to yourself, like, what does your Wikipedia page say? Mm. And that kind of keeps you like, what's your North Star? For you, what does your Wikipedia page not say that it will say a decade from now? Will not say, will like, have- like, like, what does it, will, it not will, have on there now? So you can't, oh. you get credit for nothing you've done so far, but like, oh. what does it say a decade from now? Well, I mean, regardless, just happy dude. <laughs> <laughs> because for me, so I've, I've done this thought exercise a lot in the past, and I'm never, never happy with who I am. I am miserably competitive. I, I look back on myself six months, let alone six years ago, and I hate the guy I was. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I grow so much in a short period of time, and that's good. Like, you should grow as a person. You shouldn't stay stagnant in your beliefs or your, your knowledge and everything else. But I aspire to hopefully make that person six, 10 years from now happy that I am who I am now, mm -hmm. because ultimately that's the only person that's going to matter mm -hmm. because I don't know what the future holds. Mm -hmm. So I try to live by, you know, my moral compass for what it is and, you know, decisions that I've made in my life, I can look back on and I can say, Hey, look, it may not have been popular, but I did it the way I thought I should, and I didn't cave to either peer, political, or whatever pressure that may uh, be against my belief system. Mm -hmm. that's, like, pretty, that's a pretty fucking good one. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like, like getting uh, to go public in New York. and. Uh, <laughs> Bro, come on. We just talked about YouTube taking shit down. <laughs> You can cut that. I don't care. <laughs> Where can we send people to find you on the internet? Yeah. Um, really? Beep. Yeah. <laughs> anywhere. Anywhere. It doesn't matter. Richard Ryan on all socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Again, I'm not consistent with my value propositions on there. So you want to see some photos of me skydiving, doing stuff. It's probably on Instagram talking about the world and blockchain and all that fun stuff's on Twitter and like, I'm just all over the place, blackriflecoffee.com and um, full mag, all these other different channels. It's I love it. Thank you so much. We'll I definitely do it again it. in the future. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. <laughs>